Good evening, everyone. Bill Kongoleski is state director for the Michigan chapter of the Mutual UFO Network, the world's largest civilian UFO research organization. In his 27 years with MUFON, he's heard many fascinating UFO accounts, often from the witnesses themselves. Any close encounter with the UFO is hair raising, but these are some cases where the events are so bizarre that they're in a class of their own. Kowalski, I'm sorry, Kongoleski will share with us some of these hair raising encounters tonight. So please welcome Bill Kongoleski. Thanks so much, Rob. I'm gonna start uh, sharing my screen right now. <clears throat> okay. So uh, my presentation today, um, you may have seen other presentations I've done in the past. I do presentations on UFO history in Michigan. Um, primarily, that's the one that uh, most libraries have me do and I've done it for the Carolyn Kennedy Library before. Also another one that I did uh, for your library that I do quite a bit is recent UFO sightings, best recent UFO sightings, which covers about the last five years. And then outside of that, uh, a pretty broad range uh, range of topics. For tonight, and especially because it's close to Halloween, I thought it'd be interesting to do one of my personal favorites to give, uh, which is high strangeness UFO encounters. This, these are the sightings that are really, really out there, <coughs> much more so than um, just somebody seeing a light in the sky. And uh, that's strange enough, really, but uh, these are the ones that really push the limits. Um, just a little bit more about me. Um, I've been a member of MUFON since 93, so 27 years now, going on 28 years. 16 year state director for the Michigan chapter of uh, MUFON. And so that's gonna be 17 in a couple months too. Um, MUFON itself has been around since 1969. I've only been around since uh, 1971. So um, I haven't been around since the beginning, but I have been around for half of MUFON's existence uh, already. And so I, yeah, I do a bunch of presentations um, outside of Michigan. Um, the, the second most, uh, I guess, uh, place that I, I speak the most at would be uh, certainly Pennsylvania. Um, I, I speak a lot out in Pennsylvania, but um, I've done stuff for TV, so a whole bunch of stuff. Some people ask, you know, um, what are my qualifications to give a, a presentation on the UFO phenomena? And so I just like to show a little bit of my credentials. MUFON itself, uh, depending on your familiarity with it, uh, I'll go into a little bit of detail here. Our current international director is David McDonald, and he's in the upper right-hand corner. Um, below him is uh, probably our most famous member, Dan Aykroyd. Uh, he does a lot of television for us. Hangar One uh, was our television program that was on the air for three seasons, and MUFON's own television program. Um, so that's pretty cool. And every year we have a big uh, convention. Um, this year was supposed to be in Las Vegas, but due to COVID that got uh, bumped into next year. It's also gonna be in Vegas next year. It generally moves around, but we just pretty much packed up the whole event and moved it into next year in this case. And we put out a monthly journal on UFO sightings and other UFO information. MUFON is in 40 countries and we have over 4,000 members currently. And Michigan alone tends to get about 200 sightings reported to us every year. In fact, this year we are already past 200. And a lot of that is Starlink satellites. Um, if you're not familiar with Starlink satellites, uh, uh, if you look them up on YouTube, at some point you'll see why people think these things are UFOs. They, they look pretty interesting in the sky. So a lot of the sightings, of course, that we get, about 85% of them we can identify. They're an aircraft, they're some celestial objects. They're, um, sometimes people will send in pictures and say, I didn't see this, but look, it's in my photograph. What is it? Stuff like that. But for the remaining 15% uh, uh, or so uh, every year, those are the really interesting cases. Those are the ones that we hang on for. And every once in a while, you get one that just goes beyond um, so many of the other reports that we get that we can't identify. Things that are clearly not misinterpretations of something else. 
things are clearly things that have happened to people. And if the witness is credible and if there seems to be some evidence to support them, um, we can log in um, some really, really wild cases. So the term high strangeness actually was first coined by the, the legendary UFO investigator, um, J. Allen Hynek. Um, and if these aren't his words, they've been attributed to him, uh, that it's a quality of being peculiar, bizarre, utterly absurd, but also true in these cases. Um, so when we talk about uh, some of these cases that have high strangeness to them, um, they often are just more than a sighting. They often involve entities, um, some strange phenomena above and beyond just simply seeing something. These are some pretty stacked encounters. Um, and um, yeah, a lot of these events, I, I throw in these notes uh, as much to myself to remind you that, and, the, and also tell you that um, a lot of these are really still mysteries. There are so many questions about these things that are left unanswered. But um, taking that they happened um, the way that the witnesses say they do, they are some pretty interesting things. And so uh, maybe about half of what I'm about to discuss, um, I investigated personally and the other stuff um, was the, the, the witnesses were investigated and vetted by people that I know personally or are well-known investigators. So I, I trust the signs as well. Any picture that you see in here is um, that it has a UFO in it is a recreation, something I did sort of a Photoshop job. I tend, uh, I wanted to keep um, the sightings for the most part that I could find um, somewhat local. So you see here a couple in Michigan, um, one in Ohio, one in Pennsylvania, one in West Virginia. And then the one outside the margin, um, there's a great one from California that I couldn't just bring myself to edit out. It's uh, when I really enjoy talking about the Cisco Grove incident. And for the presentation, uh, really I had to cut out about half of what I wanted to include. There are so many good high strangeness cases out there that I had to edit to fit the time frame. And so I, I have enough certainly for a second presentation of equally strange sightings as I'm about to discuss tonight. Also, um, a couple big ones that I don't touch on um, that would certainly qualify as high strangeness would include uh, Mothman um, so for, and also Skinwalker Ranch um, as two big examples. In both of these cases, um, there is so much to say about each of these, uh, Mothman and Skinwalker, that each of them alone would be their own hour-long presentation um, and, and some. And then also they've been well covered by other people doing presentations and there's a lot of TV and et cetera on those things. So, um, so I'm not gonna talk about Skinwalker or, or Mothman tonight, uh, just mostly because of the saturation and the market of those, those events. I am gonna start off in Ann Arbor and <clears throat> this is actually as weird as this sighting is, it's starting off fairly light on the strangeness meter. I am going to switch over here um, so that um, I can uh, focus on my notes. There are so many events with so many notes that I have that um, I may need to refresh my memory um, on a couple of things. And so this allows me to focus on that. Hopefully everybody can still see my screen okay. Okay, so the first one that I am um, going to mention there was a gentleman that had called me uh, in the late 90s. Um, actually, it was the early 2000s when he actually got around to calling me. Yeah, it was like about five years after the event. And <clears throat> he had uh, left me a voicemail on my cell phone. Um, I have had a cell phone since 99. And I was just turning in my first cell phone. And I had actually saved his voicemail message, but I didn't realize that I had saved it. When I turned in the phone, I'm like, oh no, this guy left me a great sighting report and I'm not able to hear it again. Well, it was about six months after the guy first called me, I discovered that I had actually saved my voicemail and I was able to retrieve it and I didn't think I could. And I listened to his message one more time. So I called him again. This is six months after he called me and left his lengthy report on my phone. 
And when I call him up out of the blue, he was certainly not expecting me to call six months later. When I call him up and I spoke with him, he was able to recount and he did recount exactly everything he said in his voicemail, essentially word for word. I, you know, I caught him off guard and he's like, oh, you want to hear about this event? Here, let me tell you all about it. Excuse me. And there was no difference between what he said and what, uh, like I said, it was in a voicemail. So for me, that was definitely my first sign indication that this guy was a credible witness. And he came across as um, very uh, well-spoken, uh, measured, um, seemed to pay close attention to detail. And although he saw something really strange, I don't think he was exaggerating. Starts off, uh, he's uh, on um, an expressway. He's driving north on 275, close to Ann Arbor area, just south of Ann Arbor, when he sees a glinting thing in the sky. He can't quite make it out, but there's something in the sky that is over the road that's reflecting a great deal of light. He's in the driver's seat. His wife is in the passenger seat. As they get closer, um, traffic is, is slowing down up ahead near this thing. They get closer and closer to it. And he sees a pyramid in the sky. A pyramid taking up so big, it's taking up both lanes of traffic in the sky. Um, <laughs> this is my best illustration of what he reported. So the pyramid was not only gigantic, but he said it was mirrored, a silvery mirrored pyramid that had hieroglyphics all over it. Um, and just to make it stranger, right? Because it's not enough that there's a giant pyramid flying, hovering over the, the expressway. And so his, yeah, his sighting when he told me about it happened back in 97, but it, it was still very fresh in his memory. So he said he was one of the many cars that pulled over and was watching this thing beneath the pyramid, which they could see at that point, um, was all black and it had these two white lights underneath it, almost as if those were propulsion, but um, the pyramid otherwise was not moving. It was frozen in place. And some people chose to continue to just drive under it and keep going. Other people were just parked there looking at it. Um, he got some names of other witnesses and kept in touch. And um, by the time that I had gotten in touch with him several years later, um, while he said he was able to, to give me some of their information, I, I never got it from him. But um, amongst the things he said, it was that somebody had actually made a police report about this. So apparently a police report exists about this thing. So after they're watching it for several minutes, he said, suddenly the pyramid moves, twists just a little bit, just a few degrees, it twists in the sky. And then it starts to slowly rotate and it's spinning in place, spinning, spinning, spinning. And then he said it's faster and faster till it turned into a blur. Then it shot up into the sky super fast. And right a few seconds after this thing shot out into space, um, two jet fighters flew over directly where the, the pyramid had been hovering over the street, over the road. <clears throat> now, the fact that it's a pyramid is uncommon, very uncommon. It's rare to hear somebody talking about pyramids, but they do see them. But really is the icing on the cake is that it is he claimed that it was covered in hieroglyphics. Now he said the hieroglyphics weren't your traditional bird, eye of forest, whatever, old school Egyptian hieroglyphics. So just it was covered in strange pictograms that uh, he couldn't um, decipher. Now, uh, moving on with the, uh, the subject of pyramids in Ohio, in Uniontown, Ohio in 95, uh, there was somebody that was at a work site. Um, he was in construction. And um, as he paused for a moment at the work site, he uh, turned around and he noticed hovering off in the distance was a massive black pyramid. And it was hovering all, low off the ground um, a couple hundred yards away. And so he's looking around to see if anybody else can see it. And he looks back and then suddenly it's gone. But he said it was gigantic was just hovering directly off the ground right there at the work site. 
And if that wasn't enough, a um, few months later, the same witness. Now, and let me tell you, let me interrupt myself here to tell you how I got in touch with this witness. I was talking about this first pyramid and at a, a, at a presentation that I did in um, Butler, Pennsylvania. And a gentleman came up to me and he said, hey, I know somebody who saw a pyramid. And he called him up. He, he called his uh, friend on the spot, put his friend on the phone, and his friend recounts the, the pyramid here that was hovering over the workplace, the work site. And then, so, um, and then uh, the guy at the, uh, at the event says to his friend on the phone, tell him about the other thing. And the guy's like, oh, you want me to tell him about that, huh? And he's like, what, Jen? He's like, sure, why not? And so the guy says that a few months afterwards, he was um, asleep in the middle of the night. He lived in a very, fairly rural area. And he hears this giant sound like a gong. It's about 3 a.m. Boom, this massive bang, a single bang of a gong. Uh, he says, uh, and it shook the house. It was so loud. So he gets up and runs out to see what it is. He looks around. He doesn't see anything. Has no idea what caused the sound. And uh, he goes. So he goes back to bed. And the next morning, uh, the farm next to him has this big eighteen wheeler parked at the farm, where. And he, uh, as he was watching, he noticed three guys in hazmat suits. This is my rendition of it. Three guys in hazmat suits herded up all of the guys' cattle, as well as several geese, into the back of the 18-wheeler. And these guys drove off with uh, the livestock next of the next door neighbor. The very next morning after this gong. So the, the witness, he goes over um to the farmer who lives next door and the farmer says you know before you ask i'm not even going to talk about it i'm not going to say a word and he never did the neighbor never said anything not word one about uh, his livestock being uh, herded up and taken away and um, he never replaced the livestock either he never replaced his cattle and um yeah that was pretty much the end of that story <clears throat> I like to, to throw in the Flatwoods, otherwise known as a, the Braxton County Monster um, in 1952, because it, it's a nice, a clear cut one that a lot of people are familiar with. And it also has some similarities, some ties to um, another case that uh, I'll talk about. So 1952, uh, there's it's dusk and uh, these three boys, are outside playing and they see a glowing red UFO um, descend on some local property. So um, they're watching this red light come down and they're like, oh my gosh, it just, this thing just landed. So they run and they, uh, the two, two of the boys that were there, they got their mother as well as some other uh, children that were hanging around. So they had a grand posse of um, six children and two of the boys' mother. Um, and they decided with the dog as well, they got, they got a dog with them. They decided to go out and check the strange red light. And so they're getting close. Um, they're approaching this red glow. And suddenly the dog shoots out ahead of them, just races ahead, barking its head off. And they lose sight of the dog. And then a moment later, the dog comes squealing back the other direction, sque squealing and whimpering and takes off. So now they're pretty nervous and they uh, um, get closer to this big red glowing ball on the ground. And they see in front of it, um, this weird mist all over the place. And the mist smelled kind of funny, kind of pungent. and when they, uh, uh, the mist started to clear a little bit, uh, here's the witnesses. Um, unfortunately, this is the best picture I could find of them, the clearest picture, but here you go. If you can imagine this crew going out to investigate a, a downed UFO. Um, so um, yeah, I'm sure they uh, really had to muster up their, their courage to, to have essentially a crew of children here 
um, along with two of the boy's mother to come take a look at this thing. So this is what they saw when the dust cleared. This thing that was estimated to be 10 to 15 feet tall, um, it had a, a circular globular head with this sort of cowl behind it and really dinky claw-like arms that was setting on this big sort of pleated skirt of a, of a cylinder. It's just really absurd. And it had these beams that came out of its eyes. So, so a really strange, bizarre thing. And on top of that, with seven witnesses, seven witnesses claiming that they saw this thing. And it was uh, frightening uh, to say the least. And they couldn't tell if the whole thing was some giant robot or if it was uh, an organic being that was sitting on some sort of vehicle. Um, and it uh, very clearly noticed that they were there. And so they all took off, <laughs> they, all, they all fled. And it, had, uh, it made this hissing sound as it started to approach them. And then um, as they started to run off, they noticed it turn and start floating back towards the light. It looked like it was floating. So the, uh, it actually, um, that very night, um, they actually were visited by a local reporter, a person named uh, A. Lee Stewart Jr. He was co-editor of the Braxton Democrat paper. And he arrives uh, to interview them because the kids were, you know, um, panicking, you know, and, you know, I'm sure some of these kids ran home and told their parents and somebody called the news. So the, the reporter, he comes out and um, he's trying to talk to the witnesses to find out what they saw. And they were all terrified. Nobody was able to, to speak coherently. So uh, he talks to, uh, talks to one of the witnesses, the oldest boy, uh, Gene Lemon, he's here in the picture on the left. They get him uh, to they talk him into going to the site, and that's uh, the mother that of the other two boys that's also in the picture. They so they get him to go to the site, but when they got there, there wasn't any sign of anything there any longer. So they're there, um, and looking around, they can't find anything. So uh, the reporter he uh, goes down and he sniffs the ground and he said he, it had a really bad acrid smell to it. Like he could tell that they did smell something really horrible that was still lingering. The next day, since they couldn't see very well, um, the reporter goes back and uh, he says that he saw skid marks coming from, uh, it looks like the skid marks came from and then returned to a big patch of depressed grass, as if something had landed on the grass, pushed it down, and something on wheels rolled out of it and rolled back. <clears throat> so unfortunately, um, many of the witnesses um, suffered from vomiting, and they had really bad irritated noses and throats uh, for several weeks after the sighting too. This is another sketch of the... Uh, <clears throat> of the, the creature. Now, uh, one thing is about uh, the, the paranormal phenomena is that sometimes uh, stories uh, take on a life of their own and the Splatwoods monster now has a museum close to the sighting, uh, the spot of the sighting. Here you see the Flatwoods monster museum and some illustrations of the creature. And um, in the left there, the picture I have here is several little toys uh, that they have inside of the creature. So this thing has taken on a life of its own. Now these witnesses to that event in 1952, that night, were potentially not the only witnesses. There's stories of other people um, having seen something similar too, um, including this couple that said, that I think the, the, the creature um, actually was roadside, something like that. But um, yeah, this is uh, this Flatwoods monster is certainly uh, now a part of American folklore. <laughs> now, uh, I go out for this next one, uh, 1964, out to um, 
the Cisco Grove uh, camp. It's in uh, Tahoe National Forest, California. This is another interesting one with regards to the type of entities that the witness encountered. So this is uh, the main uh, witness here, uh, Donald Trum, and he's out bow hunting with uh, two friends at the Cisco Grove campground. That's in the Sierra um, Nevada mountain range, actually, in Tahoe National Forest, so pretty secluded. And they are, while they're out there bow hunting, um, <clears throat> Shroom gets too far away from camp. And then when the sun comes down, uh, he decides that the safest place he could spend the night is up a tree. Um, he doesn't want any predators or any other <laughs> problem sleeping on the ground. So he says, what the heck, you know, I'll just scale a tree and sort of lean into the tree and then I'll, I'll spend the night that way. So while he's up there in the tree, um, Shroom sees this light floating around over the woods. So he thinks, oh my gosh, they got a search helicopter out there for out here for me. He's got a bunch of uh, camping matches. So he goes down and he lights the fire um, to alert the, um, what he thinks is a search helicopter to come find him. And then as he uh, lights the uh, signal fire, actually three signal fires, he sees the light uh, approaching him. Um, after he lights the fire, here comes the light. He's like, okay, good, you know, I, I'm saved. But it's not a search helicopter. <laughs> um, it's a, this big, he described it as a silent 150 foot cigar shaped craft now, Shroom is not anybody I talked to directly, though a friend of mine who's an investigator, Ur Ruben Uriarty, in fact, did a whole book on this guy's sighting. And I'll talk, uh, I'll, I'll make some book recommendation, recommendations towards the end. Now, this Shroom guy, he, although this happened in 64, he didn't, um, and his story was out there, he didn't want anybody to know his real name. And then in 2005, he finally relented and um, made his name public as the witness. So uh, Shroom, going back to the story, he's out there and uh, sees this big 150-foot cigar-shaped um, craft coming at him silently. He's got these three large rectangular windows on it. And out of one of these windows, this dome-shaped craft um, emerges. And he said it landed about, from his estimate, about a half mile away in the woods. So he is completely freaking out. He's back up the tree at this point and um, he can hear footsteps crunching through the woods uh, approaching him. And, uh, you know, he's got no idea what's going to be coming out of these woods right at this point. And what does come out of the woods looks a lot like this. <laughs> it's these things that uh, they're in these tight white suits. Um, they're about five and a half feet tall and they have these dark dark faces and big brown black eyes. They start looking around the area and he's looking down at them and um, he's, he's observing them observe the area sort of indifferently. They are very casually just kind of walking around, um, you know, kind of nonplussed about where they are, what's going on that, you know, that somebody had to it drew them in by lighting these fires. And then two of the beings look up at him in the tree. They finally see him and nonplussed, they keep looking around um, the area. And at that point, he's like, well, this is really strange. They don't seem to care about me being up here at all. What should I do? So then um, this robot, he says, uh, looking very much like you see in the picture, this metallic old school looking uh, robot with uh, reddish orange eyes that were slightly backlit um, comes out of the woods and walks right up to the tree where he's at. And this vapor, strange vapor comes out of its mouth and floats up the tree. And when uh, um, the vapor would hit him, he would pass out. He would instantly pass out and uh, he uh, then would um, fall sort of onto the bow that he had set up to, as a perch. He didn't fall out of the tree. He just uh, dropped just a, oh, sorry. Uh, he just dropped a, uh, onto his bow. And uh, so this kept up for a little while. And then 
um, <clears throat> he's like, okay, so maybe this thing will, you know, leave me alone. And, but it kept doing it. So he had, you know, he's up there with a bow and arrow. And so between these, the times that the thing was shooting the vapor up at him, he would grab his bow and arrow and he would shoot at the robot. <laughs> and he managed to hit it all three times. Now, the, when he would hit it, uh, because, I mean, this thing's just right there directly below in the tree, uh, when he would hit it, the thing would back away a couple feet and then start coming back at him. So he still got his matches on him, and he starts lighting things on fire. He lit his hat on fire, um, his hunter's license, and also cash. He's throwing burning cash down on this robot. And uh, every time he would drop something that was burning, uh, the robot would step back a little bit and then it would uh, approach the tree once more time, one more time. So he didn't know how long was this, this was gonna go on. And then it got stranger. A second robot shows up. So they got two robots and these five guys in these weird white suits all around him, below him. And the second robot comes up to the first robot and they face each other and then this electricity starts shooting back and forth between them uh, between their chests <laughs> so he's down there <coughs> he's looking at these two robots shooting electricity at each other he says like oh my gosh you know they're you know i don't know about two of these things shooting these vapors at me so he climbs higher in the tree and takes and he actually mm -hmm. bound himself to the tree somehow with his belt he says and so that um, every time they would do the, the knockout vapor, which they kept doing, um, he would black out. And um, then um, he would just sort of wake up because he was still bound to the tree. Like he would wake up in the tree. Now, the robots decided uh, that they were going to uh, um, actually try to climb up um, <clears throat> the tree. Oh, actually, pardon me, not the robots. The, the robots are just shooting the vapor. Um, two of the guys in the white suits are trying to climb the tree, and only to find out that they're no good at climbing trees. And so they, they uh, um, quickly gave up. And then so Shroom starts breaking off branches and throwing them at the beings who are trying to climb the tree. And then um, the, so as he's up there in the tree and all of these five guys in these weird white suits and these two robots are below him. He passes out for a final time, only to wake up the next morning. So one of his, as he wakes up the next day, he climbs out of the tree, he collects his three arrows, and he uh, st starts stumbling back to camp. Now, one of his buddies uh, finds him as he's trying to go back to camp and helps him out, and um, they manage to go home at that point. So he, uh, Shroom tells his wife about it, and she says, you know, maybe we should report this to somebody somehow. And he's like, well, who are we going to tell this to? And she's like, I don't know. She's like, uh, you know, I have this astronomy uh, professor uh, when I was going to college that uh, he's a pretty good guy. Uh, maybe I could tell him about it. And he's like, okay, whatever, if you trust him. And so she goes and she tells the astronomy professor. And he says that uh, um, he'll help them make a report to the Air Force. So uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the Air Force says they want to interview Shroom. And so these two guys, Barnes and McLeod were their names, um, the, or the names that they gave, um, decided to meet the, the Shrooms. Um, so um, they're, they're going to meet the witness and his wife, Donald Shroom and his wife, at this house. They give him an address to go to. And so when they go to the house, the shrooms, the house is empty, except for the chairs and a table uh, that is required to conduct the interview. So it's strange that they have them interviewed in an empty house. But um, Shroom um, shows them the one arrow that he has that got a good nick on the, uh, the robot. It's got this shiny metal on it that uh, he says came off the robot. And the Air Force says, oh, wow, we'd like to test this arrow and we'll get it back to you, no problem. Of course, he never got his arrow back. <laughs> um, but so they took a, um, they took a story and uh, they, they, they took his arrow and they said to him, it's like, you know, 
you know, maybe it was just a bunch of teenagers playing a prank on you. Maybe somebody was just trying to play a joke on you. Um, and he's like, no, he's like this, you know, but what about this giant flying spaceship that, that came and this other thing? And they're like, well, we don't know about that, but maybe it was like these pranking teenagers or, you know, maybe uh, it was some Japanese upset about the Second World War. He's like, what the heck? So yeah, the Air Force told him after this event that it was possibly, he was possibly being um, um, assaulted, bullied or whatever by um, Japanese who were upset about World War II. So um, he, Shroom, revisits the site of the event about two weeks later, and he finds that the whole area where he was is very well cleaned up. They even raked it. You can see rake marks, he said, in the dirt. And um, so he actually lost his other couple arrows uh, during a move at, at some point from one house to another. And so he no longer had any of the arrows. And um, <clears throat> basically, you know, that's how the story stood is this strange event that the Air Force seemed to be interested in it, actually went out and something happened at the site after he was there. Now, one of the things about being um, plugged in with a group like the Mutual UFO Network is that you, you have um, other people reporting things that are sometimes eerily similar to um, other reports. So in this particular case, um, this happened in Wellston, Michigan um, in July of 2013, you know, um, many years after the original, like 50 years, essentially after the original event here with uh, Donald Trum. But this uh, guy, um, Jacob was his name. He was living, um, uh, he was visiting his parents, pardon me, um, in Wellston. Now, Wellston is a really small population, less than 300. They're not even incorporated. And um, it's actually in the Manistee National Forest um, up in the Northwest part of the Lower Peninsula by Manistee, Traverse City, that sort of area. So he's, uh, it's clearly in this deeply wooded area and he's out in the backyard and it's about midnight and he sees an object a few hundred feet above the trees and moving across the sky. It was a big cigar shaped object flying silently with uh, three portholes, three giant portholes on it. Um, he was freaking out, calling his brother who was in the house, but the brother apparently didn't hear him, didn't come out of the house. And he said the whole sighting lasted about one to two minutes. So at least luckily in his case, uh, no robots. <laughs> and um, going on now to Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Now, uh, this is not a typo. Um, after we spoke about, the, after we talked about the guy um, in Uniontown, Ohio, who had the semi pull up next to his house and scoop up all the farmer's animals next door. Um, now he moved from Uniontown, Ohio to Uniontown, Pennsylvania, strangely enough. So if, uh, if you don't want weird things to happen to you, don't live in a place called Uniontown, apparently. So this one um, <clears throat> is one of the, the big um cases of stan gordon um tremendous investigator of ufos uh cryptids like bigfoot and things like that um uh, you know, very busy speaker researcher author and a friend i've known him now for about 20 years and uh, a really good guy now this particular sighting of his um starts off possibly fairly similar to something else that I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, the witness in this case is a gentleman by the name of uh, Steve Pulaski. Um, he's uh, in a pickup truck driving to his father's farm with his wife, and they see a giant glowing red sphere uh, that they said was about as large as a barn hanging um, really low over a pasture, um, very much like the Flatwood Monster UFO. And as they're seeing this thing, um, they arrive at his uh, family's house and he sees his family out on the porch watching it. So he, uh, Steve, the, the witness, drops his wife off and he goes over to the neighbors to see if they can see it. And they do as well. 
And as they're all watching it, the object slowly descends and lands in the pasture. Again, very similar to the Flatwoods monster, giant red spear lands um, in a rural area. So uh, Steve decides to go and check it out. And he hops in his pickup, not alone though, he has a shotgun and the two neighbor boys with him who are both about age 10. So I don't know what it is about, <laughs> about adults bringing children out to these questionably safe uh, UFO landing areas, but here's another case of it. Um, so he goes out to investigate. Um, and so as they get closer, they can hear noises. Like, first of all, they hear dogs barking and then they hear this really loud whirring sound. And then something that sounds like a baby crying. And they park the truck and they get a, within a couple hundred feet of now um, what's roughly about a hundred foot diameter glowing white dome. Now it's white um, parked on the ground. And they also uh, have this, this is obviously where the whirring sound is coming from. And there's also a burnt rubber smell coming from it. And so this is where things get really weird. As they're trying to figure out what this big white dome is now parked out in the pasture, they see two silhouettes approaching them. Two Bigfoot creatures with glowing green eyes are coming at them um, from walking along the, the nearby fence to this dome. And one of the creatures was about eight foot, the other one was about seven foot, and they had really long arms. And um, the fence that they're walking along is this uh, uh, six foot barbed wire fence about 75 feet from the, the dome. And they're the ones that are making the baby crying sounds. And they're making this, uh, they're having a conversation of some sort that sounds like two babies crying at each other, wailing at each other. One of the boys uh, takes off right away, just bolts, gets out of there immediately. The other boy who's uh, clinging close to Steve, who's got the shotgun, says, okay. Um, he's like, let me see if I can scare these things. So he shoots over one of the heads and uh, of the creatures. And it looks like he's got, uh, it turns out he has tracer rounds. So he can see, where he's shooting. So he fires one shot and it doesn't seem to phase the two Bigfoot creatures uh, slowly approaching at all. So he fires a second shot. And when he fires the second shot, one of the creatures like throws his hand up really quick and looks like it catches the bullet in the air. And as it does this, the dome suddenly completely disappears. And now the ground is glowing in a big, circle on the ground where the dome was and the whirring noise disappears. At this point, the two Bigfoots um, turn around slowly and they start uh, walking in the opposite direction. And so he, Steve, still um, very much in a panic, um, he and he still got a loaded weapon. He fires a few rounds directly at the creatures and he's sure he hit the larger one, uh, shot it in the back but it had no reaction whatsoever. So he's like, okay, we're out of here. So him uh, and the, the uh, remaining boy uh, hop in a pickup truck, drive to his parents' house and call the police. And it's about 9.45 at this point, the police shows up uh, and Steve returns to the, uh, to the, with the officer in the patrol car. And the glow is still there on the ground. The ground is still glowing at this point in this big circle, but they don't see any creatures. And there is some cattle in the area, but they seem to be keeping their distance. And then all of a sudden they hear the footsteps again. And this time uh, the footsteps seem to be on the other side of the barbed wire fence. And the, like the seven foot Bigfoot suddenly uh, appears out of the darkness. And he's only about 10 feet away at this point. So Steve shoots a creature, you know, at that point, 10 feet away with a shotgun you'd think that uh, you know, would have quite an effect. When the creature is shot, it wobbles for a moment and then it charges at, the, charges at him and runs right into the fence. Um, doesn't make it through the fence, but hits the fence and it stops at the fence. So the two men at this point are not sticking around, the, the guy and the, the patrolman. 
um, they uh, go back and run to the police car and drive back to the police station. And one of the, the uh, officers um, who knows Stan Gordon, um, the paranormal investigator, uh, calls him and says, hey, I think we got something that you want to take a look at. So it's about 1245 in the morning. Um, Gordon, he arrives with a team of four other people in his uh, crew and they head out to the pasture and they see Steve out there, the, the primary witness, and he's with his father. Um, Steve is told to, to stay unarmed. <laughs> and so um, he, doesn't, um, he doesn't have a, a weapon on him. Okay, so <clears throat> when they are walking around, uh, taking a look at uh, what was happening, um, Steve starts to act a little weird. Um, uh, this, at this point, there's not even a glow anymore. The cattle are still keeping a distance and they had uh, um, an ability to do a radiation check, but there's no results. And um, so Steve uh, and his dad, uh, since he was feeling kind of weird, he uh, walked away with his dad and left the investigators to do their thing. So it's about 1.45 in the morning. And Steve comes back with his dad and said that they just witnessed their house glowing uh, for a few seconds. And at that point, uh, one of the investigators asked Steve, hey, you know, where did the big bush crash into the fence? And then Steve suddenly starts looking really sick. He's having difficulty standing and it looks like he's about to pass out. But instead of passing out, he suddenly begins howling <laughs> and racing around the field crazily, wildly. He sees, Steve sees his own dog um, <clears throat> and the dog starts growling at him. And Steve chases his own dog trying to attack it while the investigators are standing wondering what the heck is going on. So when Steve tries to attack his own dog, the dog uh, takes off out of there and runs back to the house. And at this point, they're all, they all have this sort of sulfur smell um, that they can smell. It's a, it's a new thing, um, this brand new smell coming up at this point in the, uh, in the event. So um, when they got to Steve um, at the house and he's recovering um, from what had just happened to him, he said that uh, from his point of view, he was not running around. He was not attacking his dog. He was not acting crazy. From his perspective, he was simply standing in the field when he saw this dark cloaked figure appear and tell him that the people of this planet need to treat it better or we're gonna lose it. He has no memory of chasing uh, his dog around or any of that. He thinks he was just suddenly alone in the field with this weird um, dark hooded creature, um, cloaked creature, and uh, that told him that uh, we need to treat the planet better. And so uh, a few months later, um, Stan uh, wants to give him a chance to settle down. And he asked Steve if it's okay if he could be hypnotized. He's like, you know, he wants to hypnotize Steve and see if he remembers anything more about the event. And Steve replied, what do you mean hypnotize me? Your guys already hypnotized me. He's like, and Stan's like, what? He's like two weeks after the event, um, this guy in a suit um, accompanied by what looked like an Air Force officer showed up uh, at his place unannounced. Um, Steve thought that they were part of Stan Gordon's group. And um, he asked uh, the witness if it was okay to hypnotize him. And he said, sure. So they hypnotized him. He told his story under regression. And, um, you know, uh, he said, uh, Steve said he had no idea what their real names were or where they had actually come from, but they were certainly not part of Stan Gordon's group. And who knew how they actually found out about Steve in the first place. So yeah, this uh, particular case pretty much takes the cake. And not only that, there is a case actually in Michigan um, that is just similar enough um, to uh, point some correlations to what happened in the field in Pennsylvania in 1973. So um, while I say Southwestern Michigan here, I know exactly um, the city that it happened. 
I know exactly the name of the cemetery. And I have been to the cemetery. Yes, this one occurs in the cemetery. But um, the Indiana Ghost Trackers um, were the ones, uh, Tina Ronan in particular, of the Indiana Ghost Trackers told me the story. And she said that it is one of the places that they regularly option to do investigations. Um, so she asked me to please not reveal the name or the location of the cemetery. Um, so that's fine. I know a lot of that happens within um, uh, these types of investigations. In fact, for, um, when I brought up the Skinwalker Ranch earlier, for a long time, they really tried hard to keep the location of that secret. So um, I, I certainly am not going to uh, not go against that request. So in this particular case, um, it starts off in October 2010, and the Indiana Ghost Trackers um, were um, working a cemetery that they often visit, and it was already dark when they showed up, and Tina said the sky was clear, there was no cloud cover, just completely loaded with stars, and um, they all parked their vehicles. There were several of them, I think about a dozen, if I remember correctly. And they all got out of their cars and they split into groups. And um, then they started to hearing something moving around in the woods, just assuming it was a deer or something. They, you know, they didn't really take too much notice of it. Um, then um, the people in the groups that had split up began to hear whispers in their ears. Um, they were unable to uh, make out what they were saying as they were indistinct voices, but they all had this whispering effect in their ears. And so this was just the very beginning of the evening. Now, the pictures that you see of the cemetery here are all photos that I actually took when I went to the cemetery the following year. <clears throat> so you'll note in this particular picture, because it becomes important to the story, there is this sort of broken down shed um, just in the, in the background, just a little bit to the right of the center of the, 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 uh, the picture here. Now, um, this next picture here is a sketch done by Tina Ronan. And you can see that, um, that little shed on the left side of the picture here, a little bit better condition than it's as shown in the photo here. But, but yep, what do you see? in the sky above a cemetery is UFOs. It's not strange enough to go to a cemetery in the middle of, in the, after dark and hear whispers in your ears. But then um, Tina looks up and she sees uh, a saucer shape in the sky. She said it was silver, um, flying silently, hovering in place. And then um, she said it started to cloak. She said she started to see this sort of effect, like a, a steam wave, um, a mirage-like effect. But she can still clearly see the outline of saucer shape hanging in the sky. In fact, um, as she's watching it, she says uh, um, she could see that there were two other ones um, flying just beside it. She saw three disc-shaped objects, the outlines, and this wavy pattern in the sky of three disc-shaped objects. And um, as soon as she said that they were all sort of uh, um, cloaked, if you will, the three of them streaked across the sky um, rapidly and disappeared. And, um, and she says when they passed through the sky that the stars blurred behind them. So she was able to see their shapes quite clearly as they disappear. So, <clears throat> Then at that point, um, I did sort of a negative image here to make it look like nighttime. But uh, several people um, in the team uh, that didn't see the UFO, in fact, Tina was the only one that saw the UFOs. Several other people saw something moving around in the woods. And uh, when several of them would go close to the woods, something sort of was aggressively jumping out at them with the woods, uh, from the woods that had large glowing eyes, but they still couldn't tell what it was. Um, they said it had uh, glowing eyes, a, a big nose of all things, and black fur. And uh, so um, as the night went on, more and more people from different little outbreak uh, groups from this uh, um, 
started seeing this creature at the edge of the woods out that surrounded the cemetery. And then they started whispering uh, again, this time more distinctly, telling them to leave, um, to get out, or um, just some more indecipherable mumber, mumbling uh, whispers in their ears. Uh, <clears throat> undeterred, um, they decided to press on and continue their investigation. So um, the majority of the team um, got together in the center of the cemetery and um, decided to do a group EVP uh, to see if they could record any of these voices. Um, so they wanted to ask spirits if they were there, who they were, et cetera, et cetera, and keep the tape player going and hopefully uh, uh, record some of the, the, the responses. Um, they didn't actually get anything in terms of that in the in the end, but still, that's what they were there, and that's what they were doing. And a couple of the members stayed back in the woods, um, trying to figure out what this uh, creature was uh, that was moving around in the trees. Now, Tina said she was about a hundred feet away uh, from the main group, and she felt something approaching. Um, that sort of like feeling, like instinctually like something's happening something something's coming closer to me and then she watched she said um she could make out through the darkness the outline of uh, she said uh several um actually seven um sort of spectral shapes floating through the sky heading towards the group in the middle of the cemetery she made a there were seven beings entities Spirits, whatever they were, phantoms, heading straight straight to the group doing the um, the experiment in the center of the cemetery, and then they vanished before they actually got to the center circle. So Tina's already, um, you know, <laughs> quite confused and nervous about everything she's seeing up to that point. When she looks to her right, and in front of one of the tombstones, she sees a little uh, creature. Um, she said it looked like a cross between like Gollum from Lord of the Rings, um, but it had black uh, fuzzy hair and um, a, a depiction that she felt was of the um, the Pukwudgie, which is sort of a Native American um, a trickster creature. And so she's looking and it's crouching beside the, the, uh, the headstone um, and she could see it pretty clearly and it turned and looked right at her and then shot away um, very quickly. Um, she said supernaturally fast, it ran off, and, um, and she looked up in the sky, she's looking all over the place, she looks up in the sky, and she said she saw um, all three of the, the flying saucers in the sky again, but still cloaked, but so the stars, she saw three clear distinct um, shapes of saucers in the sky with the stars blurring behind them, and um, so this time they streaked away again, but in a different direction. And then at that point, they finished up their session um, at the cemetery and left um, for the night. Now, I, when I came to the cemetery, um, Tina did a, a, a great tour for me and showed me all the spots that everything had happened. And here is a picture of Tina and my friend Joe, who's also an investigator. Um, and when we were in the cemetery, you know, it's just interesting to see it. Nothing too weird happened when we were there. However, um, if you remember that uh, shed um, from a few images back, here we go, I just brought it up again. Beyond there, um, the, the big bushy area, if you go beyond there, there's a pretty wide open field on that side trees surround the rest of the cemetery, essentially. But I walked out there um, and it was still daylight. Uh, we didn't stay long after it got dark. And when I walked back there, I had this strange distinct feeling like I was being hit by some sort of energy, some sort of way. And so I ran back into the cemetery. And at the point that I caught up with my friend Joe, 
he said, uh, he goes, uh, before I had a chance to say anything to him, he says to me, he goes, you know that area just past that, uh, that little shed over there? And I said, yeah. And he's like, don't go, don't go past it. He goes, it's really weird if you go past it. He goes, real bad energy. <laughs> so I was not the only person that had actually felt that on a return trip to this place. Now, um, I am going to, um, first of all, um, stop my screen share um, and, and bring up some more um, resources. Actually, let me jump to this screen here just really quick if you want to take this down. Um, thanks for listening to my presentation. If you want to um, report your sighting uh, to somebody who will actually investigate it, report it to MUFON. You could report your UFO sighting at MUFON.com. If you want to um, investigate UFOs, um, please go to MUFON.com. We offer field investigator training and an opportunity to get hands-on with UFO investigation. And with Michigan um, handling a couple hundred cases uh, a year, um, we definitely get our hands full and we could use all the help we can get. And if you're interested in finding more about the Michigan chapter of the Mutual UFO Network, um, at our website, we have details about our upcoming meetings. Our next meeting is gonna be on November 15th, which is a Sunday at 7 p.m. Our guest speaker is a gentleman um, by the name of John Shepard, who recently appeared in a Netflix documentary about trying to signal um, creatures, uh, entities, aliens from space. Okay, and now um, some, uh, if you are interested in any of the, the topics I brought up uh, tonight, um, this book here, <laughs> The Braxton County Mem uh, Monster by Frank uh, Fraschino. Uh, I have his name in the front of the book, Fraschino. Uh, there we go. That's how you spell his last name. Um, is an excellent book on the Flatwoods Monster. If uh, you are interested in that Cisco Grove event, uh, my friend Ruben Uriarty and his friend Noah Torres uh, put out a book called The Cisco Grove UFO Encounter, which is all about the event where the guy climbed up the tree and shot arrows at robots. And also, uh, last but not least, Stan Gordon has a lot of books out. This one has a lot of other sightings that involve, besides the one that I talked about tonight, has a lot of great sightings, uh, silent invasion it's called, uh, a lot of great sightings where Bigfoot and UFOs were seen together as well. Um, great stories, so many of them. What I told was just the tip of the iceberg of some of the things that he's investigated. And um, as I said, these, um, that I've talked about tonight are just a handful of the ones that uh, I had considered uh, speaking about. So there's a lot of other really good, unusual ones out there as well. And um, I would say if you're interested uh, in the topic at all, um, yeah, it's never a dull moment in the UFO uh, biz. <clears throat> okay, um, uh, that's all I have to say. If anybody uh, has any questions or they wanna share an event or any comments, anything like that, um, certainly uh, now's a good time for it. I don't know if we want to continue recording. Uh, we could if people don't mind being um, on uh, recorded for this uh, or otherwise, uh, as I understand, um, Mr. Butler said that you could uh, put any uh, comments or questions in the chat as well. Oh, it looks like uh, Jeff has a comment. Um, let me see. I am going to. Not a question. I was okay. just uh, plotting. I think that was a very good presentation. And I heard some things I hadn't known before. So thank you. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Pennsylvania in particular um, has got a ton of interesting things out there. So um, yeah, certainly uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, a lot of the, the investigators um, that you know in, in those neck of the woods can uh, say a lot more than I ever could. Yeah. Well, thanks again. Have oh, a good night. You, you too. Okay. Um, I see something in the chat. I don't know if you want me to read it or if 
one of the librarians is going to read it or uh, you can go ahead and read it if you want oh okay um, thanks uh, that you enjoyed it. Um, how have sightings changed with the advent of cell phones and cameras? Is it easier to investigate? Um, yes and no. Um, the, uh, I'll tackle the no part first, actually. Um, one thing is that it creates new issues um, that we didn't have before. And it, it falls widely in the category of people um, filming things like they'll be at a children's birthday party and something will appear in the in the in on camera that they didn't see and it, so we get a lot of things that are explainable that people just can't identify when they're filming things that aren't uh, intended to be ufo films and uh, they'll there was this uh time for a while where people were taking pictures of the sun and having um, and when you do that, it has a weird effect where little pixels disappear. So you'll see these little black spots in the picture if you take a picture of the sun. I'm gonna guess not the best idea to take a picture of the sun, but people were doing it and um, getting these little spots recorded on there, and they're saying, "Oh wow, look, there's this fleet of UFOs around the sun." So we have to investigate a lot more stuff. Um, that is not unusual because of people taking so many pictures, but onto the good side. And that's the, the good part certainly outweighs the bad. And um, in the presentation that I do on um, best recent sightings, I, I only include a sighting in that presentation if it has video, a photo, or uh, a really excellent illustration. And because of um, the people being able to film a lot of these things with their cell phones, yeah, there's been some really good filmed um, objects. I don't know um, how many of them are generally accessible. What I often see is uh, within the confines of the uh, MUFON database, which if you wanna see cool stuff, become an investigator, you know, and you can see some of these videos yourself in the database. But um, and a few of them, you know, I, I anonymously show um, some of the videos as well. And it, there are some really good videos out there now. Um, and people um, say, you know, how come with cell phones that we don't have a lot of good videos? Well, we actually, we actually do. And um, I, I present those as well. And um, if, you know, if you look on YouTube for these videos, um, you're going to see some really interesting things that maybe really aren't anomalous. Um, one aspect of UFO videos on YouTube is that uh, generally the people that post on YouTube um, go around any sort of investigation. They just post straight to the internet and they, um, and then after it's discovered what it is that they've seen by that time all these people have seen it thought it was a ufo and never looked back to see if that they they identified it uh, um a case in point recently is a bunch of people filmed a goodyear blimp um i think it was in new jersey um and this was maybe about a month ago and it it was went super viral in social media and then very shortly after in the paper they're like it was a goodyear blimp this is what the blimp looks like but people i guess no longer could identify the blimp and people were so plugged into the ufo phenomena that they that's that's where their mind went their mind didn't go like oh what is that thing let me try to identify it. oh yeah it's a blimp no they hadn't seen the blimp in a while and they just thought it was a ufo so yeah people were pulled all over the side of the road and filming it and everything like that so there's a lot of good video and pictures of uh, this blimp yeah Anybody else? Anything else? Um, have you ever seen a UFO? Yeah, actually, um, one of the thanks for asking. One of the uh, things about uh, MUFON is, you know, they say it, like a, the dirty little secret about MUFON is we're not only investigators. So many of the people in MUFON are actually witnesses. So in my case, when I went to MUFON in 1993, uh, the the thing that I went to them with. Um, was a sighting that I had in 1989. I was in the Chevette with two buddies of mine. It was uh, in Sterling Heights, Michigan, February. It was dark out 
and at 9 p.m. we were waiting for this other friend of ours to get off of work. We were parked in uh, my friend Kyle's car in front of her house when this blue ball of light about the size of a car slowly arced over um, and it was sort of egg shaped slowly arced over the car that we were in we all three saw this and as it slowly arced over and disappeared then suddenly this white ball of light came and zigzagged all over the sky and as that light disappeared then a red ball of light appeared in the middle of the sky and grew and then shrank uh, we all saw it. I went to work the next day and uh, went to tell my coworkers about it. And turns out another coworker had actually seen something very similar. He saw a blue light zigzagging down his street the night before. And he had gotten to work first and he was telling his account before I told mine. So it's not like he was just trying to say, you know, joke around and, and say that, you know, just add something on to what I had seen. He, you know, his, uh, you know, sighting known before I could tell anybody. <clears throat> so that's that was the first thing that I let in with MUFON. And you know, I've had uh, uh, I've had a, a number of other strange things that I've seen over the years. And um, yeah, that's why uh, I was impressed with the way MUFON had the first thing that I brought to their attention. And I then I, I stayed on board ever since. Okay, uh, all right. A uh, handful of questions just popped up. Um, okay, are sightings more common at night? Yes, because um, a lot of things that are lit um, don't appear as easily during the daytime. People do have daytime sightings, uh, no question about it. But uh, when you add to it uh, the different lights that are seen in the sky at night, including a lot of identifiable lights that people uh, don't know what they are. Yeah, that I would say the majority certainly are still sightings that happen at night. Um, and um, I don't have this particular map as part of my presentation this time, because this presentation has a unique focus. But in um, some of my other presentations, what I do is uh, this. There is a software called UFO Stalker and great name, huh? And uh, it's embedded into our UFO reporting database. And one of the things that you can do is um, put in, hey, software, show me on a map the last one up to 100 sightings in Michigan. And when you do that, you always get a population map. And it's the, the rural areas, uh, have less people living in them, so the rural areas have less sighting reports. Um, and you'll so every time you'll see the biggest clump of sightings around Detroit, Grand Rapids, you know, Traverse City, things like that. We used to be able to actually plot a thousand sightings uh, with this software. They don't let you do that anymore, go that wild. But when you did that, you would be able to track I ninety four, I seventy five through the state. Um, it's very much a case of where there are more people, there are more sightings. And um, any state you do that in, if you want to know where the population centers are in any state, um, go to that state and punch in, give me the last 100 UFO sightings and you'll know where people live. And that's, and that's the reality of it, um, is that UFO sightings are seen all over the place and also all the time. Uh, you know, with about 200 sightings a year, you know, you understand that uh, we get sightings in almost on a weekly basis here in Michigan, a new sighting. So this happens all year round. There isn't a special time of year where we get any more sightings, um, with the possible exception, a tiny exception around 4th of July, but um, th that's mostly insignificant, the spike we get around then. But yeah, all over the place, all the time, year after year it's not letting up it's still going it's still trucking um and with uh, michigan move on we have had roughly about 100 members ever since i joined uh it's a it's a mystery actually in and of itself we would advertise like crazy and try to draw in new members and try all these different outlets to draw people in and nothing would happen. And then we would drop all advertisements sometimes for long stretches and 
it wouldn't matter. It seems to be that uh, about 100 members is uh, where we're at. No, we don't seem to shrink. We don't seem to grow, regardless of what's happening. Um, other states have uh, more members. You take a state like California, it's so big that they have two separate chapters, North and South California. And Texas has three, I think, at the last count that I know of, because um, they're so big. So um, yeah, that's what we have going on for us. Okay, um, last chance for any comments, questions, or shares? Yeah, so, can somebody tell about their UFO story? Well, I actually had a question. Mm -hmm. um, do you, back, I think it was in December of 2012, the lights over Rochester. Did do you do you know if they have ever discovered anything about that more? <clears throat> Can there's actually as strange as <laughs> strange as it is sound. It's calling to mind a couple things. Can you can you be uh, specific about this particular sighting? So it, it was around Christmas. I want to say it was early December because um, we were coming home for a Christmas party and we were coming home from Rochester Hills and um, there was like three lights in the sky that were going over the freeway. And I remember we pulled over to, to watch them for a while. And a lot of people kept think, keep thinking and saying that they were like those Chinese lanterns. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just like three triangular lights and they just kind of hovered for a while and then they just kind of disappeared. Mm -hmm. hmm. No, and it does sound vaguely familiar. Now the thing, the thing in my case is like, if you, it, with Michigan having about 200, again, about 200 sightings a year, when you asked me to go back um, eight years, that's like 1600 <laughs> sightings ago. <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, it, it vaguely rings a bell. Um, I don't know for sure. Um, now, the thing about Chinese lanterns is that, that they're a real easy tell. Um, they flicker, you know, more than they strobe. And they're real slow moving. And they are weird looking. But um, I don't think what you're describing at all it sounds like Chinese lanterns. Um, and it sounds a bit early for drones, too. Now, drones have really been an interesting issue for us. There's this company in Michigan called Firefly Drones. And if you go to their website, you can see a demos of some of the things that they're able to do with drones. What they've done has appeared even on the news as potential UFO sightings before it's been identified. Um, but 2012 sounds like a little early for that technology to, to be the cause. Yeah, I have no idea. Okay, I see everybody but me is muted. Um, again, I'll say anybody, anything else? Okay. Um, thanks a lot, Bill. Oh, thanks so much, very much, Rob. Yeah, um, and it, it seems like there's potentially uh, interest uh, um, in some of the, the new UFO report sightings um, that has the pictures and the videos and all that good stuff at some point as a little nudge, like maybe somebody, um, and maybe especially when we get back to in person, that would be a good one to do if, uh, if you'll have me back. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. <laughs> okay, well, have a good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you very much, Bill. It's been a very good talk. And this will be, I'm gonna put this on, uh, our site on Facebook tomorrow. Okay. So. Thanks so very much for having me. So right. Thanks everybody for coming and listening. And if you're interested in uh, more UFO stuff, yeah, look, move on up. Okay, take care. <laughs>